How's everyone doing? Are you excited for lunch? Because that's right after this talk. OK, so this is an interactive talk. And we're about to watch an interactive video. And the way it's going to work is this. I'm going to show you a video. And at a certain point in time, uh, three choices are going to come up. And you need to help me pick which one should I choose. And the way it's going to work is that whoever yells the loudest, that's the one I'm going to pick. OK, you ready? Two people are ready. Great. Check it out. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh my god. Jill! Oh my god. Wow, it's, it's you! That moment when you vaguely remember someone that totally knows you. Help Jill remember just when and where they hung out and what his fucking name is. It's been a minute, Jill. How are you? Oh, I'm really good, yeah. And how are you? Tell me anything, everything. Oh, you know me. Just same old me. Except, you, know, you notice anything different about Wait me? for it. Um, one little... Okay, which one? Word. Scar, hat, yes, fin? Yes, I know. It's like a unique difference. Okay, it got scar. Yeah, it, it's your... Neck scar. My scar? Everyone can see how deformed I am. You know, it's no fun being a former conjoined twin. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, you can watch the rest online. I still have a talk to make. Uh, but let's go back to the talk. Great, like you enjoy that. So, hi, I'm Ofer. Uh, I'm a creative developer at Echo. Um, and, Echo, and you might have known me from my greatest hits, like, uh, have you tried clearing your cache? Don't, don't put that in X99, that's not gonna work. <laughs> or, uh, no mom, I don't know why your computer is running slow and I can't fix it, sorry. <laughs> so, Echo is a platform for choice-driven entertainment. We power uh, experiences that are kinda like between a video game and TV show, just the uh, like the one you just saw. And because uh, that's what we do, then user interface for us is a first class citizen. Uh, it's important for us that the user interface is as engaging and as interactive as the videos that it serves. So that means that we have uh, all sorts of interesting things going on, like uh, the buttons that you just saw on more uh, complex interfaces, or on mobile, we do th interesting things with touch. And um, because all of the technology is web-based, it makes my life a little more uh, interesting. And we, I can't just use like a bootstrap button when I want to uh, show an interface because our users expect the interface to be fun. So let me show you a feature that I worked on. Um, so in video games, you often have the options to save the game. So when you drop the game and come back to it at a later point, then you can continue from where you dropped off. So we have something similar in uh, our projects. They're called checkpoints. And these checkpoints are saved every time you reach a decision point in the narrative of the story. So the interface for that looks like this thing on the bottom. You have the play pause button, but also like a timer that shows when is the next point uh, go checkpoint going to be, and whenever you reach that checkpoint, there's an animation that tells you that, and if you click to jump to a previous checkpoint, there's this whole rewind thing happening, and the same uh, applies when you jump forward, and there's also like an indication of how many checkpoints do you have. So it's a fairly complex piece of uh, UI, and there's a lot happening here. There's like uh, uh, CSS animations, and um, JavaScript animations, and there's like a shader in the background that does the, uh, the VCR effect. Um, and these are all done with React across multiple components at the same time, and it needs to work with the video in the background, and it's, it's a thing. So <laughs> that leads me to the title of this talk, which is Managing Animation, but not just in complex apps, because as you know, when you're working on your 
on your app, on your piece of software, everything that's not just trivial gets complex really fast. So that's why insanely. But it's not just like how to wrangle all the animations and make it work somehow uh, and make it work with duct tape around the corners. No, you need to make the manage them so that they work sanely so that future you doesn't hate past you for writing that code. So to, to kind of understand what we're talking about here today, uh, we need to tackle two things. One of those is animation and the other is state. So what exactly is animation? Does anyone recognize this thing, this game? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a game called Cuphead. Um, it's a, a platformer, a 2D platformer, and with animation based on like a principle of the th uh, animation from the 30s. It's pretty cool, and I want you to focus on these little birds on the bottom with the nails attached to their head. Uh, they kind of look like this, if you can tell from the, from the screen. And you're not actually looking at the bird with a nail attached to its head. What you're seeing is discrete frames over time. These are separate drawings that someone took time to painstakingly paint each and every one. And you see them in a rapid succession, and your brain tricks you into thinking that's uh, a moving object. Great, so if you look at this mathematically, we have this. Animation is basically a function that takes time as a parameter and outputs a frame. Great, so that basically describes animation uh, for every Disney movie ever, but um, Disney movies or other uh, types of uh, animations are the same every time you look at them. So if you see The Lion King for the hundredth time like I did, you might cry again when uh, Mufasa dies. But uh, it's still the same, basically the same movie. The only thing that changes is you. Um, but the UI animation is different because uh, every time you, have, you run a new UI animation, not the same thing happens. So it changes based on things like app data. Different users see different things at different stages of the app. It also changes based on user input. So in this example, when the, the mouse or the finger moves over the, uh, the to-do list thingy, well, the animation changes based on where that input came from. Um, so that tells us that in this context, animation has another job. It's not just to look pretty. It also, it's also a tool to convey information. And that's an, import, that's an important bit. So let's take an, an example app like uh, this uh, email, like web email client, sort of like what Gmail does. So in this context, we have the, um, the compose message window. And when you send, there's an animation that kind of zooms the window upwards. Okay, great, nothing too special about it. But let's take another use case. So where uh, in this instance, you just discard the message. You don't want to send it anymore. So you have another animation that closes the window. In this case, it kind of drops down. And the exact same action happened. So you have the window. It was open. Now it's closed. It's same thing like before, but the animation tells you it was closed for a different reason. Now let's take a more involved use case. Um, in this use case, you write a message, and you want to save the draft of the message. So here we have something a little more complex happening. You have the animation of the window kind of closing and minimizing into the icon of the draft section. And this animation serves a cause to let you know, it serves a purpose to let you know that the, the draft will be waiting for you in the draft section of the app. So there's a bunch of things happening here. You have the, uh, first the animation for the, uh, the modal window closing down, and then the icon uh, animation notification app uh, kind of jumps and expands. And these things happen across different components, and they have to happen sequentially. So they have to happen in this exact order, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't tell you as a user that, listen, if you want to find your draft, it will be waiting for you on the top left. OK, great. So that's regarding UI animation. What about state? So it's great that this is a React conference, so I don't have to actually 
fully explain and go in depth into what state is, but I do want to uh, shed a bit of light about what I mean when I say state in the context of this talk. So let's say you're working on a social network. Oh my god, you can't see anything. So let's say, hypothetically, that you're working on a social network. Um, and we'll call it my face. Okay, so your team is working on this uh, little chat thingy on the bottom right. And the feature that you're making is that if you receive a new message, there's a notification that says that there, there's uh, something there gets colored red when, uh, when you get a new message. Okay, great. And when you click the chat to indicate that you read that message, then the notification goes away. Another team on the other side of the campus is working on the, like the header of the page. And they also have a small notification for red messages. So now, if a user clicks either on the chat, the small chat, or the header, then the notification needs to go away. Oh, and there's also another team working on a big chat so I guess you could look at the little chat where you're looking at the big chat. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's what they're working on. And the same thing applies there. If you focus on that uh, piece of uh, UI, then throughout the app, the notifications for red message need to go away. So there needs to be some way to coordinate all this data that while it, several components, need, different components need to use it, uh, it applies to all of them, and the logic is contained in a single space or a single position. And so when I say state, I mean the current snapshot of the app data. And you've worked in React. You've done things in your life. You know that handling app state is hard. And that's why a lot of uh, smart people wrote uh, a lot of uh, squiggly icons that represent uh, software libraries that help you solve this. And regardless of which software you pick, um, they all work kind of in a similar fashion. So this is an example of, uh, of uh, Redux, but don't ca catch me and, uh, in the, the minute details. Basically, you have some sort of store uh, where all the app data resides which updates some sort of view, which is, then again updates the store via some sort of mechanism. In this case, it's the actions. Um, OK, great. So ta let's take this newfound knowledge um, and try to build something with it. So the thing that we're going to try to build is this uh, to do, uh, not to do, but uh, a multiple select uh, component. So we have a list of items. You need to pick one, and then or multiple of those, and they get added to a list. So what would the data structure of this look like? So you have the, what I call the less fancy select, because it's not styled or anything. It's just the bare bones uh, uh, UI. And you have an array of selected options and the array of possible options. Great, let's run through how uh, selecting an option looks. So first, the user clicks on one of the options. Awesome. The option gets added to the state. Yeah. The view re-renders. It happens almost instantaneously. The user clicks on the second option. Second option gets added to the state. And once again, the view re-renders. Great. No, I didn't say anything new now. But let's try to take this and make something fancier. So here's the exact same functionality, only with animation. And it's kind of hard to understand what exactly is going on. So let me try and break this down. So first, a user clicks on an option. The option get, gets added to state. And the uh, option disappear animation starts running. So this is the animation where you see on the bottom, like there's the mask that closes down on the option. Great. Next, the squash animation, which is the next options moving up to where the previous option were. Uh, starts running, and also at the exact same time, the rectangle appear animation. So you see that this is a little rectangle, rectangle popping up. And these need to happen at the exact same time. OK. Then the label expand animation. So you have the label that you chose, so whatever option you chose, and the rectangle expands, and the text appears there. Great. 
So this is what happens in this uh, scenario. So what happens if a user clicks a few options rapidly? And this is not a hypothetical question because you know what happens with users. It's what happens when a user does that. Because users don't do what you wanted them to do. They do the exact opposite and things that you didn't want them to do. OK, let's run through that. So the user clicks on the first option. So far, so good. The option gets added to the state. And you can see how the state looks on the bottom right here. OK, you have the option, this option in the select the options. OK, the option disappear animation starts running. OK, we're good. User clicks on the option, the second option. Wait, wait, OK. And now the second option gets added to the state. And OK, okay. now what? Hmm. So the thing is, nobody defined what should happen to animation in this scenario. I mean, your graphic designers, your motion designers, did a really awesome job of describing what the animation should do when it works properly, but not when th weird things start to happen or where the user does things that they aren't really expected to do. Um, and then you run into different and interesting cases, like what happens if several animations target the same elements? Well, what should the element do? Or maybe now you need to consider how to animate an element that wasn't even added to the DOM yet, or what about an element that just left the DOM? How do you animate something that doesn't exist yet, doesn't even exist? And when I encountered these for the first time, I was like, okay, I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> this is the last GIF in the presentation, I promise. I limit myself to one GIF per presentation. So this is what I say when I mean, uh, this is my, what I mean when I say insanely complex apps. They are usually comprised of two main characteristics. The first is that there is mul multiple rapid state changes and multiple components. So it's not just limited to one component. You have several components that need to animate. And the second thing is that animations span across multiple components uh, and can be activated at arbitrary times. So you're not in this ideal scenario where you're, like someone does one click per minute. No, it's users. They click all the time on everything. And that's the crux of the problem. Not your users, mind you. The crux of the problem is this. Like we saw, animation is a function that takes time and outputs a frame. But state is a function that takes an old state, an action, and outputs a new state. So the two of these don't actually talk the same language. Animations don't care about logic, and state doesn't care about time. So to drive the point further, I'd like to tell you a little story. You might not know this about me from my uh, pristine exterior, but I'm kind of a slob, especially when it comes to uh, you know, being at home. So I was sitting at home one day on the couch, uh, watching TV, minding my own business, and I hear my wife uh, telling me from the other room, uh, listen, you left the bathroom in less of an ideal state which was true. Uh, so why don't you come and sort that out? And I mean, she's right. Um, and that is true. And I mean, I'm sitting watching TV. I have no argument against that. So I would like to, uh, to uh, do, go and do that. But then as I'm in the bathroom sorting things out, I realize that I have, might have left the living room and also sort of a disarray. So she tells me, okay, but fix the living room as well. And at this point, I have a few options, which I'd like to now illustrate in a diagram format. So this is the first option. I go to the bathroom and start cleaning it. And then I get the request to clean the living room so I can immediately drop what I'm doing and go and clean the living room. And the thing is that when she gets to the bathroom and sees that I haven't actually done what I was supposed to do, uh, she's not going to be too happy about that. If we take this to animation land, this solution is called skipping, which means that you have an animation running, and then an action comes along, 
and you just skip to the next animation in line. And there's also another variant of this, which is skipping with fast forward, which means that uh, the first animation kind of jumps forward as soon as you get the, the prompt. And then um, the second animation just continues as it would. OK. So the obvious, uh, the obvious uh, upside to this is that the animation is always updated relative to the state. But the downside is that you'll be jumping between states and like the animation looks really janky because you're kind of cutting the animation at every given point. OK, here's another uh, solution. I go to the bathroom, and I start sorting things out. And then I get the prompt, but I finish what I need to do. And then I go to the living room, and then I sort things out there. And only once I finish, then I can go to the bedroom like originally planned, but that would be five hours later. Uh, and we're not going to be watching that episode. And again, she's not going to be too happy. Um, OK, and in anima an animation land, that solution is called queuing, which means that you have an action, uh, you have the animation, then an action happens, and then you just queue the next animation to happen after the first one finishes. OK, at this solution, the, uh, the advantage is that animations will always flow fluidly from one to the other. Uh, and the disadvantage is that the UI always plays catch up with the state, so it doesn't actually reflect what's happening uh, in the state at that given moment. OK, there's also a third solution, which is uh, I go to the bathroom, start cleaning, and then I also go back in time and clean the living room at the same time. And you know how it is with time travel. If offer from the future touches offer from the past, the whole space-time continues get destroyed. And OK, I realize that my metaphor completely breaks at this point. Uh, but, but bear with me. It does work with animation, and that's called additive animation, which means that you have two animations working at the same time on one element. And, and to show how this works, let's say that you have this uh, rectangle on the bottom left, and one animation tells it to move right, and the other animation tells it to move to the top left. So the addition of those makes it move to the top right. So to see it in action, um, let's say you have this sort of animation with skipping. So you, the user clicks somewhere, and the animation s just skips there. If we do this with editive, it means that there is these little arcs, nice arcs that make the rectangle um, move fluidly. OK. So this additive uh, animation solution is like, it works well, but just for uh, certain types of things that you need to animate, usually position. It doesn't work for all sorts of properties simply because they don't work together. And even for, for uh, position, if you try to move something to the right and to the left at the exact same time, it just won't go anywhere because if you add these two up, it adds up to zero. Um, there's also a fourth solution, which is that I go to the bathroom and lock the living room. And then, no matter how many times she tries to get in there, she will simply not be able to, and then she won't be able to tell me to do anything. Um, and you might have guessed it, that's not going to make her happy. In animation, this is called limiting access to the UI. So you actually block actions from happening while something uh, else uh, is playing. Uh, I'd also like to call this abusing your users. Uh, because while it does make your designer and project manager happy, uh, the, it won't make your users happy. And this should only be used, in my opinion, as a last minute resort. Um, simply because it serves more the interest of uh, development than the interests of users. OK, so, so which ones should you even pick? And the answer is, it depends. It's all about managing expectations. If your app needs to show things happening in real time, because the, the current state is super important, then you do that. You do skipping, because the, the state of the app, it's, it's more important to have it show current data. But if your app is all about like feel and cool UI and UX and the fluidity is important, then do that. It doesn't matter if the state catches up and it takes a few seconds to get there. 
So, okay, that's the theory behind all this. Uh, what tools do we actually have to achieve, achieve this? So we have a lot of tools to do animation with React. Um, let's go through a couple of those that I tried while to, to well, I tried at work to solve my, my problems. So the first is React Transition Group, uh, which is kind of a lot like a, I call it a low level tool because essentially you wrap your component with React Transition Group um, and the Transition Group takes care of you know, hiding it, showing it. That's cool, but the thing is, it's kind of like only good for a single component and it deals mainly with enter and exit animation. So if you have more than that, then that's uh, just, you need more. You need, just need more. Uh, and there are Spring-based libraries like React Spring, React Motion, and React Anime, and they are also great. Um, and they deal more with like how to move things from one place to another. So you change the state, and like the animation should magically take care of itself. Uh, and that's really good. Only um, they also kind of aim at single components, so not really cross-component communication. And they're very springy. So the whole thing is that you don't set up a time for the animation. The library magically decides for yourself how long it's going to take. And if you work with a motion designer on an anima animation, and you, they won't be happy when you tell them, listen, I know you set this easing of this animation, but the software is going to decide for us how long it's going to take. Um, there are uh, Pose-based libraries, like React Pose, also a great library, um, that kind of can work on uh, parent components and child components. Um, but again, it's very springy. Not a bad thing, but just not good for my use case. Uh, and doesn't really communicate across multiple components that aren't related to each other. And that's why, like every other software developer, I saw 20 uh, different implementations and decided that the world needs another one. Uh, and I wrote uh, the orchestration-based uh, React Animation Orchestrator, which is an open source library that you can use to uh, solve extreme cases of uh, state and animation mess. Um, so let me show you how that works and how my solution uh, works. And again, I just want to stress that it's, it's for the use case of having really uh, complex and robust animations with a lot of rapid state changes across components. It's not something that I would use if you have simpler, uh, less complex, or things that can be solved with the other uh, 20 excellent libraries out there. OK, so let's start to untangle the mess. First, let's remember that generally you have this, uh, a store that updated view, and the, and the single directional data flow that updates the store again. Um, React Animation Orchestrator sits on this white rectangle that you can't see. Um, and it kind of talks directly with the view. It doesn't talk with the store and doesn't talk with the state. So whenever a uh, view changes, the React Animation Orchestrator uh, reads that change and knows what to affect in the view, which animations should start and when. Um, and if you have multiple views, then you still have one uh, instance of the React Animation Orchestrator, and it, as it, the name implies, orchestrates the animation across the different components. Um, how does that actually work? So under the hood, I use uh, a, a great JavaScript animation library called GreenSock, and this has nothing to do with React, it just operates on DOM elements. Uh, and this library, it doesn't matter which like father library you use, it works with all of them. It's a really great library. I use a special feature, or uh, a specific feature, called animation timelines. And these are data structures that allow you to um, schedule different actions that take time. So you decide when and how and exactly where animations take place. And the way it works is, let's say that there is this animation here. Let's do play. Okay, and you see that, like, that this animation has like, different anim anim uh, elements animated. This is not React, this is just green sock and this is a hard-coded animation, but the timeline makes it so that the animation is clearly defined and well-defined at any given point in time. So you can actually scrub through this or do reverse 
or whatever you want to do. You just have that option. So I leverage this, this the power of GreenSock uh, for uh, the React animation orchestrator. So let's see how that works in action. Let's say you have your page, a page component. And in that page, you have the fancy component and some other component. And our goal is that when the, the props of page component changes, we want to animate the fancy component and then animate the, some other component. OK, so how would you do this with the uh, React Animation Orchestrator? Three simple and easy steps. Uh, the first one is to create the animation sequences themselves. So that means just defining what elements should do what uh, regardless of state, just the animation itself. And this is testable by its own, and it can be played with, with the debug tools. OK. The second one is to register these sequences to uh, the, your components. So that means this component does these animations, or has these animations at their disposal. And the third one is defining scenarios that decide when to trigger these animations. So this is what glues the state to the animations themselves. So how does this work? Let's say we, uh, we want to define the animation. We define it by, as a function. We call this, uh, this uh, instance, look at me animation. It receives a ref, a reference to the element, the React element that we're working on. Actually, not the React element, but the actual mount and the DOM that we're working on. Um, it creates a new timeline. Timeline is a green sock uh, concept. It does whatever animation we wanted to do. In this case, it's, uh, it's, that's the API for changing scale, rotation, whatever, and returns the timeline. It doesn't run the animation, just defines what animation are we running. OK, so that's just defining the animation. Next, we register the animation to the component. So you have your fancy component, um, and at first, you define the reference that's relevant to you. So this, in this case, we have uh, a div. That's the only component. And you have the, uh, the reference. And the, then the, uh, we save the reference. And lastly, we register the animation to, the, to this component. OK, great. Uh, we end up with attaching the animation to the component, which means this uh, component has this animation in store. Great. Last step is defining a trigger that runs this animation. So this is the page component with the fancy components and some other components and the more components. And you have the trigger that tells it that when this prop changes, in this instance, grab attention, and the value changes from false to true, then run these animation. OK. I just want to finish up with showing you how this actually works. OK, so okay, so here we have uh, our multiple select. And the animation here, it runs, runs slowly, so you can see what's going on. I click the first one, I click the second one. And you can see that the animation gets queued. So I can click how many of those that I want, and it just runs by itself no matter how many times I click because it knows to queue these animations based on the state change, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is that if I wanted to do the exact same thing, um, but with uh, not with uh, uh, queuing, but with, interrupt with interrupting, then I would just add this interrupt true flag. And go back to the demo. And now, if I click the one and then the other, you see that the first animation just popped out, like you would expect earlier, like I showed you earlier. And this is just one changing variable, and this is super and highly configurable. And again, open source, and you can go out and just test it for yourself and see if that works for you. Amazing. So just to recap, we saw the problem, and that is that function that state takes uh, old state in action and gives a new state, and that 
animation takes time. We saw the solutions. And I showed you the animation orchestrator. So thank you so much. Have a great lunch. <laughs> <laughs>